All right. Um, I've been doing uh, a lot of talking already. Uh, maybe it's a good time to tell you who I am. Uh, I am a geek by day and a geek astronomer photographer by night. Uh, I won't tell you what company I work for. I've been working there for 20 years, but it's what we did after San Fran. <laughs> Some of you figured it out. And no, it's not Google. So uh, this is Alabama Hills. I will show you with all the photos. I will show you where it was taken, when it was taken, in the month of these, and what settings I used. And the notes will have all of this, including the photos should be clickable, so you can go to even more detail, like when and where, when and where, what I did with it. So I want to start with something that inspires me. Maybe it'll inspire you. Anyone know who this is? Oops. <laughs> so again, I'm Stephen Christensen. I work for some company that I didn't name. And this is the thing that inspires me. If, if you leave with nothing else, you hopefully with that. So I'm start with a puzzle. What happens if you take 100 general images like the one on the left and one image like the one on the right? Any ideas? You get a star. You get a That's the sneaky thing that I'm going to be explaining to you. OK, let's do an eye chart. Hint, the correct answer is green. And B, which one looks better to you? B. B, yes. Uh, is these stellar images? No, but that one's kind of bad. The one on the left. Actually, I just have this pointer I can use. How about this one? A or B? B. B. Why B? It's something you don't see every day. And I'll explain a little bit about that, too. OK. A bunch of shots or one shot? One shot. Oh, this is a panoramic shot. I talked about before using a ring like this. Okay, so these five shots were combined, and you can do it in Lightroom. You can do it now. They added it recently. You can do it Photoshop. You can do a bunch of other tools. Since I'm talking to Adobe, I want to explain that sometimes it doesn't what I want, but most of the time it works really well, especially lately. So that's how you can combine shots to get a wider field of view. So let's talk about why you would photograph at night. And first of all. Show of hands, how many of you would say that you, you know how to do night photography? Raise your hand. Uh, I should put my hand down. So. Uh, how many of you would like to try night photography? Raise your hand. OK, one last question. How many of you know me from something else already, just out of curiosity? Wow, cool. And those of you I said I paid to do this, thank you. <laughs> So let me explain why you might want to do light, night photography. One of the reasons that I find phenomenal is that cameras see colors and dim things at night that you can't see with your eye. Now, there is an asterisk there. The reason I put an asterisk there is because the human eye is actually a very powerful instrument. You can see very dim things with your eye. But the camera has an advantage over you. It can look without blinking for a long time. You can't. So that gives the camera the edge. It also has an edge because at night, your color vision is horrible. You see things that are gray scale. In fact, a lot of people are surprised when they see the colors of stars. Did you know stars have colors? They're blue, green, nope, that's the one color they are. Orange, yellow, white, and shades in between. There are carbon stars that look like, look bronze, right, red. Uh, Betelgeuse is in the night sky, that's in Orion. It's very red. If you squint your eyes, you can tell, but a camera will show you. Another reason is that night photography is not something you do with an automatic mode of your camera. Getting out of automatic mode is, in my opinion, the best way to learn photography. Because you control what the camera does, not the other way around. In fact, somebody asked about apps. One of the things I get asked is, is there an app to automate that? And my answer is, why would you want a computer to tell what you, to do, you want to do? Because it already happens in life every day. No, you want to be the creative control, not the other way around. Um, and hopefully, you'll come away with the thought that night photography can be revelatory and inspiring. I'll talk about that in a bit. And all the cool kids are doing it these days, right? Good reason. 
So this is about my adventure in night photography, but actually it's not just my adventure. It's also, more importantly, what I learned from failure. Yep, I failed. On a number of times, I'd also like to give credit to my wife who has inspired the heck out of me in so many ways uh, to let me go out in the middle of the night, not come back till 3 a.m. many times. And I would say that it's okay because I have photos that prove what I was doing. <laughs> but you know what my camera can do by itself. Because I already talked about it. So how do you avoid failure? That's a good question. Good Everyone wants to avoid failure, but you avoid failure by practicing at making mistakes and learning from them. If you try something and it doesn't work, great, try something else. And by the way, one of my favorite models is exactly what just came up on a few it. Learn from the mistakes of others because you don't have time to make them all yourself, okay? Hopefully you learn from my mistakes and therefore will make some of the mistakes that I've made. And what I'm gonna do is give you a chronology of my night photography, starting with this photo, also Mission Peak, just looking away from that post you saw earlier, looking toward, this is Mount Allison, and the fog is pretty cool. Now, raise your hand if that's a cool, if that's a cool shot to you, if you like that shot. Don't be okay. No, seriously, here's the settings that I use right here. Can anybody see anything wrong with those settings? Go ahead, shout it out. 30 seconds is too long. I've heard 30 seconds is too long. For those who are listening in live, thank you very much. Uh, the guesses are 30 seconds is too long. That's, the, the aperture is too small. That's the biggest thing. And the ISO is too low. So the takeaway for this particular shot for me is when I took this shot, it was one of the first night shots that after doing a lot of daytime photography, especially with Fred Leonard, for those of you who's right back there. After doing a lot of daytime photography, I tried to do night photography. I'm an amateur astronomer, I love it. This looks so beautiful on my LCD screen. <laughs> Looked like crap on my computer monitor. And if you were to get really close, you would see that that's true. What did I learn from this? I learned that cameras have limitations. I learned that night is not like day. And then you should think, duh. But it's not obvious, I think. The difference between a 30 second exposure and a 60 second exposure is what? One f-stop. It sounds like a colossal difference of time, but it's one f-stop, that's all. And you can't believe your LCD at night, but your Instagram is pretty reliable. So I tend to judge my night shots by looking at the Instagram. If the histogram has some spread across the display, meaning from light to dark or dark to light, then I'm more likely to like my image. So yes, you're correct. It was very low, the ISO, uh, very small, the aperture. And fog can be beautiful, and sometimes you need technology to catch up. This was back in 2008. And I did my best with Photoshop to get the noise out of that shot. That's after getting as much noise out as I could. It was severely underexposed. But what do I mean by technology needs to catch up? This was the image taken before that one. Same night. But the image you see now on the right was one that I processed about two years later, three years later, when there were better tools, better noise reduction tools, including what's in Photoshop and Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw. So, you learn, as you look at some of my shots, that sometimes shots that didn't look like they work may work when you get better ideas or technology. This, I talked about, those of you think early, I talked about my headlamp, the red headlamp. This is not, I repeat, not a daylight shot. In fact, sorry if I'm ringing a little bit. It's my booming voice. Um, if you look up, where are they? Sorry if I'm, oh there, right there. See, that's a star right there. See that? There's more stars. And this was the beginning of twilight, so it wasn't <laughs> completely dark. It was where you could start to see things. But I wandered out with my son, having looked at, let me, let me tell you the story before I got there. I saw a Mono Lake webcam of the snow in Mono Lake on the Tufus. And I said to my son, son, that is going to be a great shot. Let's go there. So do you know how you get to Mono Lake in the winter? You have to drive through South Tahoe because none of the passes are open. Think of Mono Lake most of the time, you just go straight through Tahoe Pass, it's about five hours and you're there. But 
In this case, it was a seven hour drive, because we had to go through South Lake Tahoe to get there and so on. But I walked out, I had a white a tungsten flashlight, it was a, a Brinkman or something like that, to light the foreground tufas. If you look carefully at the foreground tufas, and that's what these things are called, you notice these are warmer color than those. The ones in the back are just lit by the twilight. The ones in the foreground are lit by my thing. The foreground sand was lit by my red headlamp, which I forgot to turn off. <laughs> and that's really cool your ex what you're saying, because I tell you what, I use red all the time now, and green, and blue. This is what you would call, to me, I would call a happy accident, OK? After Bob Ross, right? There's, there's no accidents, there's just happy mistakes or whatever. No mistakes, just happy accidents. So a couple things from this that I learned. You can be inspired by seeing what you have somewhere or seeing a shot somewhere. You can, if you're willing to travel, go get shots that you might not have thought about getting. And I recommend you try it. And don't be afraid to make mistakes. Sometimes mistakes produce really cool images. This is also, in 2008, uh, Leonard will know the shot. Because Leonard and I were hiking up Mount Whitney. Again, a fledgling night photographer. I think I'm pretty good at it. Here are the settings. You notice the ISO is a lot higher now. Yeah. You notice the f stop is quite a bit lower now, so it's a big, it's a bigger opening. But this image was still extremely noisy. It was taken on a Canon 40D. And this is after a lot of post processing to get it to look like this. Well, the noise was awful because it's a poor performing camera and I bumped the ISO up too high. I did not have to go that high. All that stuff adds to the noise. It's a feature of your camera, which is why when somebody says, what ISO should I use? I say, experiment. It depends on your camera. It depends on the, city, the situation too, but mostly it depends on your camera. So this is 2008. So high ISO doesn't solve every problem. In fact, if you set your ISO too high, what you might end up doing is blowing out the stars, which do have colors. In this case, it was a lot of moonlight, so you kind of lose the color of the stars anyway, and I had a process for that. And the other thing is that noise is a pain. Avoiding it is worth a little bit of effort. All right, anybody know where this is? Uh, so for those who are listening in, the, uh, one of the uh, things that somebody offered was it's uh, Memphis, it's uh, no, it's okay. Someone offered a sutra bath. And in fact, you are correct. It is sutra bath, which is on the western edge of San Francisco. Okay? Now, what's interesting about this is you see two very strongly different colors. You see a brown foreground and a white background. I chose to set my light balance based on this, based on the poop on the rocks. Yeah, that's the first poop, in case you're wondering. <laughs> Why the Cliff House had their lights on at 3 o'clock in the morning, I have no clue, but I'm kind of glad they did. Unfortunately, there was a big fog bank offshore, so you couldn't see anything. It would be really cool to see the shot with stars in the background, but you know, that's the way it worked out. And this, the foreground, is all lit with sodium vapor lights. Those are those ugly, ugly, ugly brown lights that we see everywhere, where my red car turns gray. Mm -hmm. And most things are indistinguishable because sodium vapor light is very monochromatic. It has very few <coughs> spectra. It's not like the sun. It's not bright and white. So it tends to make everything look similar. So you have to deal with that. But the, the, my takeaway to this is that the color that you choose is also an artistic choice. You can be realistic, but with so many different sources of light, especially at night, you can't always do what you want. You can sometimes process parts of the image differently and say, OK, I'm going to use this color light balance for this section, this for that. That sometimes will sal uh, salvage a bad image. One of the first expeditions that I did was this one. Anybody recognize that? Yeah. Don't look at the upper left. Yeah. That's cheating. Yeah, no. yeah. OK, so this is the Mary Avenue Bridge. It was right over 280, yeah. right? The, you have to know when they turn off the lights on the bridge, and the goal was to get there at twilight before they turned off the lights, which I think was 10 o'clock in the sun, but still do the same. And here you see 
dramatically different setting. F22, 20 seconds, ISO 100. Very, very low ISO, very small aperture, but a very long exposure. Why? Because the bridge was really bright. And I had to do something to control the bridge. So you see a huge disparity in shots between this one and the other one. And the sky was still quite bright too. Uh, this was color from the, had this, the sun that had set. And by the way, this is facing north. Okay. Another example. This is my first star <laughs> drill. And I, want you, I want to point out two things. Number one, you see it says 2008 and 2009. Huh? It's a really good guess. I get to it That's a good guess. So this wasn't because of the news. Let me tell you about this shot. Uh, I also led a group, uh, this was the Bay Area meetup, night photography meetup. I led a group and we went up, this is the Bispo Pines. Uh, this is really the southern, southern end before you get to the really good stuff. But this is right off the side of the road. We were gonna, uh, we were going to camp at, I uh, can't remember the name of the camp. It's a high elevation, astronomers go there all the time. So I did scouting during the day. I only had two pieces of information. I had my GPS, so I knew exactly where I was and which direction I was facing, and I had an inclinometer. Inclinometer measures the angle above the horizon. Okay? So, what you may or may not know is that the North Star, which is that thing right there, the North Star is exactly at your latitude. So, currently we're about 36.8 or something like that. That means the North Star will be 36.8 degrees above the horizon. If you're at the North Pole, where is the North Star? 90 degrees, straight overhead. If you're at the equator, it's on the horizon. So knowing that, I knew that to get an image circled around the tree, how far I had to get back from the tree. But I had to deal with the fact that I was on the side of a cliff and everything. And, and I didn't measure it completely. I would rather that that be right here. I would rather that that circle be down here. But since I did this set up all during the day, I was pretty happy with the result I got. This is eight minutes, of expo eight minute exposures, 19 of them for two and a half hours. I set the camera up to let it take photos. I went to sleep. I set my timer to come back and change the battery. And this is where I learned some failure things that you really need to know about. You can plan the night shots during the day with the right tools and little know how. The moon can be your friend. This is all moonlight. In fact, I timed the shot so that it would start as the moon was setting. So I get some blue in the sky, and you can see satellite on the tree. Right? In the long run, I'll talk about that in a minute. They're wonderful tools. And this, I use light mode stacking. I could not have gotten this with one continuous 2.5 hour exposure. It would not work. It would be blown out where the stars would disappear because you have to stop down so much. So this is a technique called light mode stacking. Okay, and then in red. I got up, got to my camera, and I realized that the way it was rigged up on my tripod, I could not open the battery door to replace it. So I had to take the camera off to replace the battery, which means that my alignment was now off and there's no way that I was gonna get it back to the, the way I wanted it to be. So that's a failure mode. In fact, as a result of this and several other uh, bad experiences, I developed something called the Sackers Checklist. On our website, it's 27 different things to check. I know you're thinking 27, that's a lot. Trust me, it's still not enough. But it helps to have the full idea. Okay. This August 2010, I visited Hawaii. And if you look down here, you see it says an eight hour photo. And if you look up here, I say the 21 hour photo. See it? Which is it? Did it take you? Eight hours to shoot and all the rest of the process? No. My wife and I were staying on the, uh, not the hill side, the hill side of Hawaii. Kona. Kona, thank you. We were staying on the Kona coast, which is two and a half hour drive from the summit of Mauna Kea, where this was taken. So we drove up, that's two and a half hours. I set up my camera, we drove down. We drove back up, found that I did not connect the intervalometer, so I got no shots. We drove back down. Came back up, set up the camera, set up to take shots, drove back down. Drove back up to pick up the camera, found that I did have exposure. Yay! 
all the way to make some mistakes, which you'll show you, and then drove back down. So all that was a lot of driving for eight hours worth of exposures. I'm okay with it, really. Um, I want to show you the side benefit of taking um, 160 different exposures. Are you ready? Come on, I clicked the button. Oh, I forgot to say, water marks are forever. Star Circle Academy is what I used. This was back uh, before I had a website. I was Stephen the Amusing. That's my amateur magician performing name. Stephen the Amusing. Okay. Um, and one thing I want to think about is I say some of your best opportunities come from being considered. There is like a ranger station at 9,000 feet. This is up at 11,000, 13,000 feet. Um, and the ranger was clearly trying to dissuade anybody from going up there because the road's not repaired and you can get altitude sickness. And I said, well, you know, here's what I want to do. And just so you know, I drive a car up mountains all the time, so that's not a problem. Number two, I've been up Mount Whitney. That's even taller than where we're going now. I said, I'm just looking for a place where I can get a view. And I've mapped out using uh, Google Maps and the photographer of the Fenris where I think I want to stand. And he said, you can't go there. He said, because that is a restricted area because there was some sort of bug that was in native to Hawaii and it was off limits. Then he says, but go over here and you should be able to be all by yourself and have a great view of the radio telescopes in the foreground. So being considerate and listening to the ranger got me this photograph. Okay? I think it always works and the watermark forever already explained. I think I 
process uh, on the laptop, which I'll talk about in a minute. So this is a little over bright. It's actually worse on my display than what you see, so it's not as bad here. But what you saw was trucks going by and lighting oh, this formation just off, off of Highway 14 in Red Rock Canyon State Park. Oh, it's a random light painting. <laughs> yeah, a random light painting, or vandalistic light painting, depends on your point of view. But I used it. I didn't have to bring any light. I didn't have any light at that point in time. But the reason this is interesting to me is a couple things. Number one, you saw that I made a time lapse out of it, which is kind of cool. And the reason I made a time lapse is somebody said, well, what images did you use? And at the end, I showed you how they all stacked together to form the one big frame. The reason this is interesting to me is because this is the result that I got. See, 2010s I collected. 2012 I tried to process it again. 2017 I processed it again. This is what I ended up with in 2017. So it's the same images. I think it's a fewer number of frames. It's actually shot at the same time. I had two cameras, so I'm kind of cheating here. But um, better result because I had a little more twilight in it. it better Photoshop. Photoshop processing skills. By the way, this image is what's on page 399 of this book from my shop. So if you buy it, I get nothing except you can see my image. Okay. So takeaway is good processing, good data plus processing can get you an interesting result. And if you keep trying new approaches on old photos, you sometimes come up with something unexpected. That's kind of what happened here. In fact, I will show you some more examples of that in a minute. So it's not true that fame arrived in 2009. Fame arrived in 2010, but I shot this in 2009. Anybody recognize this? Well, of course, as it says, it's like a big picture, I never write. It also has this, oh, they're not showing it. So how do you do this? Well. This is HDR, high dynamic range. It means multiple shots. Because if you just took a picture of the sun and it's exposed for the sun, everything else would be kind of black. If you just take a picture of this, the sun would be blown out. So it's several different exposures. In this case, it's three. You could probably do it with two. But the reason it's three only is because I took 20, 30, 40 of them at the time. And I picked the foreground that had the wave pattern that I liked. And I also wanted to pick one where someone was standing in the beam of light, just kind of to give it some realism. <coughs> Interesting thing about this photo is when I won the Astronomy Photographer of the Year, which is, that's me standing in front of these images, um, my friend will say, hey, uh, we came with you, we were with you, we want royalties. I say, sure. First of all, in proportion to the number of pixels you occupy in the photo, and only if you can tell me which one you are. <laughs> I didn't pay out a thing. So high dynamic range, I explained that. And by the way, high dynamic range is something you can do at night, too. I'll show you a photo in a little bit that really required high dynamic range, and I didn't shoot it that way, and you'll see, see why. Um, and this is not an affront to Adobe that HDR software produces an ugly result. That's kind of universally true. The technique that I used to combine this is what I learned from Harold Davis. He has a book on HDR processing. He had a book called Photoshop Room 2, where he described this sort of thing as well. That's what won. So I owe Harold Davis a lot of credit for that, that shot that won. The same place tonight. I actually went there to shoot this. I didn't go there to shoot the beam of light because I'd seen it been done. The only difference between that is I was one of the few people that walked up, hiked up to the top where I could see down and everything. And that was what was different about the shot. Everybody would shoot that shot at the beach level. So I set up my camera, went to the Big Sur uh, Inn or Tavern or whatever, and got me some sandwich. Knowing that they probably gonna lock the park up at night, I warned the ranger, I said, I'm gonna set my camera up there, is that okay? I'm gonna come back and pick it up. He said, yeah, no worries. I was afraid I'd have to come back and crack it on before all the tourists start running up there, but uh, it ran all by itself and it got me this. The interesting takeaway for this is that a good daylight shot off makes a good night shot. The other thing is, this wasn't sequentially processed. The image with the sunset was taken hours before all the other images were taken. In fact, I screwed up the settings on this one again. I did not intend for the moon to come into my shot, even though it was just a crescent moon. But what happened, I set it wrong, so I didn't get the exposures that I wanted, and I had to start it all over again. But when I went processing, I went, you know, that's a really cool image with that 
sunset low. So this would be like, this is um, 32 images. So this would have been like 100 images before the first image of the second. You don't have to process it. I don't feel like I'm cheating because the camera never changed direction and they were all continuous exposures. Now, your personal boundaries might be different from mine, but I have no problem with that particular one. So this is my wife's favorite photo. Again, Patriarch Grove. One thing about this shot is I left the color the way the camera chose it. And you'll see a lot of photos. It was very popular to render your sky always as blue and your color, your stars always as white. In this particular case, I actually tried it. I re-rendered it to make it look, quote, natural. But I ended up liking this. There are a couple of takeaways on this shot that I want you to catch. First of all, I get asked a lot, well, Stephen, did you notice how the Milky Way leans the same way as the tree? That's pretty cool. Yeah, I did that once. <laughs> I knew where the Milky Way was going to be, and I got in the spot to get it. How did this tree get lit like this? It was literally a blue LED light like the headlamp I showed you before. I just tried it. Now, those of you who do light painting, I will tell you an important thing. If your camera's here, your light should not be here. If you've done portrait photography, you know that head-on light just makes people look bizarre. But if you're willing to get off to the side at a 30 or 45 degree angle, you get a better result. That's exactly what I'm doing here. So here's my camera, and I'm clearly over there, right? Camera here, I'm here, going that way. Now I haven't told you this, but I usually use red to indicate that it was high, that it was a high-performing camera. In this case, it was a Canon 5D Mark II, and I've indicated that it's painted by me manually with light. How long did it paint? Depends on your subject. These this uh, didn't require a lot because they're pretty reflective. And this is also an example, again, where color balance is a choice that you make as a photographer. You can make it realistic, but something you may not know is that the sky actually is brown overall. Not that brown, but brown. And it's not because of sodium thicker light either. It's just kind of the frequencies of light that are in the sky. So here's another photo, and Mary was showing me her photo from the same location. She actually came with me. Uh, when we hiked here to take some photos, and she won an award with it, right? Yes. Yeah, hers wasn't as cheesy as this one. Okay? Uh, so I went, I went there twice. That's why I've got the two things. I don't remember which one of the times this was. This is one time, and this is another time. What's different? Well, my position relative to the waterfall, but let me tell you what I wanted. I wanted the Milky Way to go like this. So it looked like it was just the waterfall was an extension of the Milky Way. You can make that work if you go at the right time and do the right planning. This was a little bit closer. You can see here it's way off to the right, here it's closer. So that just kind of proves it's possible. And the cheesy thing that I'm talking about is I went and did these crazy little star things up there. Just Photoshop nonsense. Uh, and I don't mean that Photoshop is nonsense, I mean that is nonsense, okay? I know, I know, I know, I know where I am. Okay, let's get even more creative. A couple of things about this shot. This is Alabama Hills. You should, should say up there. Huh? Where is Alabama Hills? Where is that? Alabama Hills. The question is where is Alabama Hills? And the answer is if you can find Mount Whitney, you're right there. It's right at the foot of Mount Whitney, very near Death Valley very near the town of Lone Pine. It's actually, I might even get chucked out, because I tell you, this is one of my favorite places so far in the world. I haven't been everywhere, so I've been much further than I have, but I love Alabama Hills, and all of you have seen Alabama Hills. I guarantee it. If you watch truck commercials when they're going these crazy things in the background, that was Alabama Hills, or truck. If you saw the movie Tremors, which probably you didn't, but maybe you did, maybe you had a bacon fan, you saw Alabama Hills, it's featured in it. If you see almost any old western, they were filmed in Alabama Hills. Why? Because it's a dry climate, it's a dark climate, and you've got these really crazy rock formations like this. This is called Cyclops. Uh, it's one of the names for it, or Double Arch. The thing about this photo is I 
stole this image from my friend Eric Harness. Eric, if you're watching right now, I apologize so hardly. Um, although I was next to it, I didn't give him the primary position for his shot. But what he did is he did a really good job of light painting. That, I did a really bad job. So I went back and I light painted it. Now you'll notice something else about this image that's probably different from what we've seen before. Do you notice how the star trails look? No. They're not backward, that's a good guess. But do you notice how they taper? Right, they ride on one end and they taper. I call it comet mode. Well, this is a trick of how you process the image. Basically, every image does not get an equal brightness weight or an equal opacity. How do I manage that? Well, here's my plug. Advanced Sacker Plus by Star Civil Academy will do this for you with no effort whatsoever. And I'm working on a newer version. This is written 14 e But that's how I produce that. Also on my website, starcivicademy.com, you'll see tons of other tricks that I use, like to hit the sky darker, make the stars stand out, some of that's built into the to plug in for Photoshop. Here's another example, same deal. This is strong, strong moonlight. Like, that's why the sky is so blue. And that's also illuminated. This is also Red Rock Canyon State Park. And again, creating the stars for Academy, that's a plus. I haven't seen anybody writing that down or going to the website. What's wrong? Go ahead. <laughs> um, this was also light painted by trucks, but the moon was so bright, it didn't make that much of a difference. But my point here is by creatively processing the same sets of images that you use, you get a different result, different look. Can you stack them backward? Absolutely. That's a feature that's coming in 15 that's not native in 14, although my website explains how you could do it if you wanted to. Backward just means instead of going this way, they go this way. Sometimes that's a better effect. OK, uh, case in point. I have a two hour webinar. This is another commercial plug. I apologize for being so commercial. Uh, two hour webinar where I teach all the things that I'm telling you right now about and, and much more about how to stack stars, how to plan shots, the software to use, and I give you examples, and files to use. The same software can do this and that. Star Trails and Time Stacks, it's Wednesday. It's not full yet, so you should be hitting your browsers about now. Um, Bitly, Time Stacks, or you just go to my website and click webinars at the top and you'll be able to find it. So I'm going to take a little bit of a philosophical turn here and tell you that you need to dance with the one that brought you. What do I mean by that? I mean that as a kid, I used to get a telescope from the high school. This is in suburban Washington, D.C. Okay? It's, it's a bright town in Camp Springs. I used to lie out on my roof at night, including in the winter, to watch meteor shots. Okay? That's what I mean by dance with the broad. If that inspires you, follow it. Here's an example of a Perseid meteor from Livermore. I call it Livermore Rain because I'm really clever. This is a photo that was taken with a telescope that I bought and in a dark sky place. I did not do the processing. Remember I told you about Rahelia Brown Graham? He did the processing. That's why I was good. But there are tricks to this. In fact, I have a webinar on that, too. I don't conduct it very often. So what I'm getting at is whatever inspires you go. This is an image. I didn't tell you this, but uh, I was just on the East Coast for two weeks. So my body doesn't really know what time zone I'm in. But this is the place where I first got my taste of the dark sky. If you've not gotten a taste for a dark sky, please go do it. And I put a lot of rubbish up there, and I apologize for that. But the takeaway is that I was out on my boat. We had been water skiing and swimming during the day. We had dinner at a dock, and we were going back to the other dock where we actually had parked, where we parked the boat. And it's the first time I saw the Milky Way. Horizon to horizon. Brightest day. I, I saw many so many stars I couldn't even imagine it. It was that overwhelming to me. And what bugs me about this is there's few places in the country you can go to see that anymore. In fact, even here, you see how much light pollution there is now? Even there. And I, I ask it this way. I, mean, I wonder how many other kids' lives could be changed by seeing something revelatory, something inspiring like I saw. 
And hopefully you will venture out to a dark sky and see something like this. So sorry about the philosophical bent, but I think it really needs to motivate your thought. Uh, I'll add Mills again. This is that arch. This is one of my students, in fact. Notice that it's green. I did not color in Photoshop. That's actually what color many Perseid meteors are. But remember, our night vision isn't really good. So you kind of see shades of gray. Plus, they go so fast. But that's the color of the meteor. Now, this is obviously lit with, with an orange light. So, yeah. Again, remember I played with lights, that green, blue, orange, yellow, whatever, all sorts of things. Uh, that's a part of the Milky Way. That's the dense part of the Milky Way down there. This is Alabama Mills. This is one of the places I tend to go. And this is where I'm going to go for the Perseid meteor shower, which is coming up in August. Unfortunately, that event is sold out, so I can't help you with that. Hey, but so look, you've got a question in the front row, too. Question in the front row. Oh, you did? Hmm? Oh, yeah. I cheat. I use Hubble. You shoot and use levels. So you see, <laughs> you see, it's the space yeah, well, telescope, yeah, which we've all paid for, and gets their data, and then puts it out there. Well, I don't even process it. It's beautiful. Oh, you just steal the pictures from NASA. That's, That's fine, too. They don't need processing. <laughs> Somebody process them. Well, okay. yeah, they were processed, colorized. I mean, uh, no. uh, all kinds of filters. Anybody recognize? Well, it says I give it all away, and then I go ask you where this is from. This is Crater Lake National Park. Probably in my top 10 most beautiful places in the world. Now, your top 10 might be different from mine. In fact, I have a website article about the top five destinations in the West. This is one of them. And it's, you don't see anything because it's the color of the lake that's so amazing. It's, it's a blue that you still see anywhere. But the thing about this shot is, like I say, think outside the frame. And I talked about this earlier. This is actually a series of photos. Right? As I say down there, 12 photos, but unlike light mode setting, these are stacked left to right or added left to right. Lightroom and Photoshop are really good at this these days, with the occasional exception. So this is something you can do and try, and you don't need any special apparatus. I happen to have this fancy rig sitting up here that I built um, that makes it easier and makes it more accurate. But you can just take the camera, and if you rotate it, you can put three, four, five, ten shots together even at night. Another example of that. Uh, a couple of takeaways on this one, in fact. A lot of people say, hey, get the darkest sky you can. Get away from that nasty light pollution. Make sure there aren't any clouds in the sky. Oh, oh humbug. That's crazy. The truth is, sometimes at night, the clouds can be just as interesting as they can be during the day. But there's a caveat. If you're in a very dark sky site, do you know what clouds look like at night? <coughs> Black holes. So light pollution is actually your friend for moonlight in order to bring out clouds. And this was actually at, well after sunset. The cool thing, m many of you already know this, but let me just put it right out there. Most people leave the sunset long before the good color shows up. Same thing happened here at, uh, Anybody recognize the end of the place? Still on? Yeah. People all over the place. But they all left as soon as the sun's at night. Yes. Now I get my chance. And of course they stayed there for another hour or so until it got dark. By the way, the core of the Milky Way is right here. This, you see this, this is called the teapot asterism. There's the handle, there's the dome, there's the spout, there's another one over here. That's Sagittarius. The core of the Milky Way is right, is right here where the spout is. Right here. That's the core, galactic center of the Milky Way. If you see the teapot asterism, but you don't see the Milky Way, I guarantee you, if you can't see it, it's not dark enough. I was uh, just over the Golden Gate Bridge, took a shot of the city as I was coming back from the main I looked and I saw the teapot asterism. I went, oh, the Milky Way is there. I couldn't see it with my eye. But I worked with it, and I got a little bit out of the camera. But of course, as you know, San Francisco isn't exactly a dark sky area. This is uh, a mess. This is the same thing as the other. I was just trying to take a panorama using a light source that I'd never used before. It was too bright, too dark. I couldn't get it to work out. But it's kind of an interesting shot in and of itself. And part of the reason is that there was a lot of color in the sky anyway. In fact, I didn't point this out before. But if you notice there's a green band here, that's called sky glow. 
It's an atmospheric condition. The atmosphere heats up at night, it heats up during the day, and it gives off radiation at night. You can't see it very well. It's too dim for you to see, but the camera can see it. Sagittarius is the teapot asterism. Can I see it here? Hmm. Yes. Looks like it's right here. Right here. And I can't hold it steady enough for to show you, but yes. By the way, uh, does anybody know the name of the brightest star in the sky? The person with the correct answer will win a book. The sun. The sun. The sun. The sun. Ah. Ah. So for those who are listening in, somebody said the sun, which is cheating. <laughs> it's also correct. I heard some other answers. Just raise your hand, I'll call on you if you think you know the brightest star in the sky now. Is that Venus? Venus. Venus is the brightest planet in the sky. Sir. Sirius. Sirius. Am I serious? <laughs> yes, it's Sirius. It's the brightest star in the sky. If you see anything in the sky that's brighter than Sirius, it's not a star. It's a planet. Or the sun. Or the moon. <laughs> Or satellite. Right. But it's not a star. Yes. So uh, I also want to point out this other accident that I had right here. This is also Alabama Hills. I set up my camera incorrectly, so it took a four minute exposure, then didn't take an exposure, then took a four minute exposure, then four minutes didn't take an exposure. What do you think I did wrong, by the way? Ah, somebody said it. Interval. Noise reduction. I had long exposure, noise reduction turned on, I forgot to turn it off. So when you take a four minute exposure, the camera says, hey, I'm going to shut the lens and do nothing for four minutes while I collect all the data to make sure I can get rid of as much of that noise as I can. So it took me four hours to figure that out. And yes, I was sitting out on a rock with my friend Eric for over eight hours that night. But it came out okay. But here's the thing. I could have done this by taking all the exposures and omitting every one, every other one, right? So you can be creative. You can get the dotted lines without making the mistake. Okay, this one I showed you earlier. This was the five images combined into one. The interesting thing about this, as you see, it's only 15 seconds, F2O, 24 millimeters. This very same rate. I only have one lens for this camera. This GP lens, which is really good lens. And it's five exposures left to right, just like the crater light one. Why does this look like that? Because it was taken at late twilight. So there was still enough glow in the sky, but after it faded just enough that it still lit this foreground, and there's a little bit of glow from the city of Lone Pine as well. That would light it up. I did not have to have the process this, which is kind of a shock to me. I do know from having done this lately that you can also, on this camera, so up to 6200, us twice 30 to 6400, and you really don't lose a lot, but in some cameras you get totally. But anyway, the thing that I I use this, I spoke to the uh, oh I'm gonna run out of time, so let me let me make sure I get through this. But I spoke to the Astronomical Association about this. You know, they take those deep sky pictures like the Andromeda Galaxy I showed you, and they take the, the, the Rosette Nebula and all these other really cool things. But they never have foreground. And what I told them was, if you really want to wow people, you put an interesting foreground with something they haven't seen in the sky before, and then you got them. Hopefully I'm right about that. It's been working so far. Has it been working? Okay. Almost there. You can also look at the world differently. This is that same formation you saw with the guy who was sitting next to it in the meteor. But I say think outside the box, see the world differently. You don't have to imagine, you don't have to put this in the frame that it is. What are you looking at? Well, this is the western horizon, that's the eastern horizon. In fact, there, that, that set green band, that's the air glow that I talked about before. There's a little bit of it here, just a tiny bit. All I did is I did a, what I call a vertebra. Taking pictures slightly diagonally, but it was almost straight overhead. And I stitch those together. It's a panorama, but it's vertical. And I like it because it messes with people. Oh, by the way, right there is the Andromeda Galaxy. So if you get a smudge like that in your shot, that's probably what it is. 
So be willing to see things differently. Um, spend time where you find inspiration. Really. Life's too short not to. This is another place that I really enjoy. Let me briefly tell you the story of this. This is the Hatteras Lighthouse in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. So one of my workshops um, a couple years ago rented a seven-bedroom house on the oceanfront, and uh, a chef to cook his meals. And uh, we had a week there. And it was time so that we could get the Milky Way as it arises in the, more, in the early morning and to the off-season so that the rates would be reasonable. I want to do that again. Anybody like to go take a yes. shot? Raise your hand if you... Okay, then I might set it up again. So this is the rising moon. That is a falling meteor. And this needs no introduction. It's the Milky Way. One of the questions we can ask about this is, how come the lighthouse isn't blowing out your camera? Good question. I know you didn't ask, but the, the reason is lighthouses, well, that's one reason, water vapor, but the main reason is where are lighthouses trying to send the light? Out to sea. Out to sea, not down where I am. So if you get below the broadcast beam, you're going to get something like this. Is that always true? No, it just depends. Uh, this is the event that's going on in Alabama Hills, I'm sorry to say, but it's full. Those of you who are in, it, in the class, and some of you are, good for you. I do have an event to catch the Gemini meteor showers that still has space available. It's in, uh, it's, notice the dates, Wednesday through Friday. See, you can't reschedule that to the weekend? No, I'm not really good at changing meteor shower dates. <laughs> I did have somebody say, hey, that thing with the moon that you wanted to go to, can we do it like next week? No, I can't move the moon in the sky yet. I'm working on it. Um, so this is another example of catching the moon behind something. Washington, D.C. is the Capitol building. The Capitol building. You know, that kind of looks like Trump's hair. I never noticed that before. Uh, so uh, this is just an example where I did some calculations. Say, hey, well, I told my wife, I said, you know, I can get the moon behind the Capitol building. I've always wanted to do that. She said, well, go. That's where you live. Said, yeah. So I went. I'm glad I did. This is another example where my wife supported me. And hopefully your spouses or significant others won't say, you're just a weirdo if you go out in the middle of the night. That's just crazy. It is. Mine says, go, just don't, don't ask me to go with you. <laughs> go, don't ask me to go with you is what I heard. Anybody recognize like this? Oh, well, it says at the upper left. So, yeah, it's Paris, the Eiffel Tower. The main thing about this was jockeying for position. And I know this isn't really the kind of light photography that you were thinking you'd see, but A, it is night. It is the city of lights, okay? And can you imagine what this would be like if it did have some stars in it, with a Milky Way in it? You probably won't get it very well because the city is so lit you won't get the Milky Way, but you can get some pretty cool star formations. In this case, it's dominated by the moon, which also lit the clouds. Okay, I'm going to point out something you may or may not realize about photography. Photography is a record of light over time. That's what it is. It can be evocative, it can be clever, but it's light over time. So night photography is especially interesting because it's the motion, usually, that makes things interesting. This is Lion National Park. I was actually trying to take a panorama of those mountains. Fine, just come out of the tunnel and it was twilight. But a car drove through. I went, like, oh, that's a better shot. So again, happy accident. Here's another example. Three different kinds of motion here. You got airplanes, you got stars, and anybody know what this light is? I'm pointing at the lower left for this. Those are hikers with flashlights. There's no roads there. It's another example, Santorini. You find a windy road like this and you see cars going up, and I just gotta find this place where I can see as much of it as possible. Right? There you go. It's motion. There's other kinds of motion. Motions of clouds in the upper left. Motion of clouds in the lower left. Sutra bath again, just pacing a little bit more to the right. Motion of some numb, numb skull walking down through the Alabama Hills spires with the red light while this camera's running. Yes, I'm the numb skull, and that is my shadow. How about this one? 
You, you might get trouble doing that. That's right, just hold my camera right up against the window. I had to kind of block it out so I didn't get reflections internally. And it took photo as the plane was taken off. This one, same technique as the stars, it's just that it's a little longer delay, and I chose the time when the moon was setting. Crescent moon. And I already told you, I kind of figured out, I know how long it takes for the moon to move, so I know how long to wait between shots. But what do I do anyway? I take three or four times as many shots as I need, because I never know when something's going to happen. Okay, I'm almost getting to the end, and hopefully I can show you some Photoshop tricks. Uh, not a lot of them. The same photo you saw before. Same idea, it uses the same stack te stacking techniques as for stars, as for all, most of the things that you've seen already, which are multiple <coughs> exposures. This one is 114 photographs, and they were taken with the camera at a specific setting. That's the key. You don't want the camera to meter the light because then it'll grow dark or dim or light or whatever, and it'll just, just be obnoxious. So you have to set a specific setting on the camera and go with it for the duration of the shot. Okay, a couple of quick tips. And I'm trying, I'm gonna not belabor this too much because it's, again, you can get on the website. So, oops, I went too fast. Okay, I'm way ahead of myself now. So, one thing is like taking a series of shots, so you're taking a panorama. The worst thing that can happen is you take a panorama and then you go take another panorama, you take another panorama, and you try and put panorama A with panorama B, and then you get mad. Don't do that. Just stick your finger or your hand or something in the way, put the lens cap on so that you can tell which sets are which. And yes, Lightroom, you can say Lightroom, Figure out which shots of these were taken the closest in time to make them a group. But sometimes I get it wrong because it doesn't know how fast you were. Maybe you went, okay, you just got three different ones as far as light group concerned, it's one sequence. So I put my hand in the way and I get even clever. North, north, south, east, west. So I remember which direction I was facing when I took that photo. Only because I might want to go back and take that photo again. So those are things you can do. Don't use uh, the shutter button. Use an interrometer, the one external to the camera. There are many reasons why I like to do that. I won't explain them all, but it's on my website. I already talked about focusing. I talked about the lens band for those of you who got here early, which is to prevent creep. And gaffer's tape to block out straight light. My wife hates light. In our house, the microwave oven has gaffer's tape on it. The alarm system has gaffers tape on it. Because she likes to sleep with the door open and she doesn't like blue light invading her sleep. I actually agree with her, by the way. Okay. Intervalometers, what do they do? They just press and release the button. If you remember that, that's all they can do, you're good. If you start assuming that they can change settings on your camera and stuff like that, you're going to go wrong. All they do is press and release the button. You can say how long to press it, how frequently to press it, how long to let go, and so on. If you get that right, you'll, get it, you'll figure out what your problems are generally. Okay? Now, there are more sophisticated systems like camera range and others that can actually change your exposure over time and do all sorts of fancy stuff. I have bought several of them. How many do I use? I use this all the time. Get a Photoshop processing tips. I'm not even going to address these because I do want to. Oh, I'm out of time almost. Am I in trouble? We can still use the next 30 minutes. Okay, um, well, since I did a lot of questions and answers beforehand, and it took some during, I will, I, it'll only take about 15 minutes to show you the, the Photoshop here, so I'll show you. But the one thing I want to say is one and two are actually the same thing, said slightly differently. If you try to process your photos in an uncalibrated monitor, especially on a laptop, you're asking for trouble. Why? Because you'll never get it to look the same way twice. It won't print the same way. So my one piece of advice, if you're going to be serious about producing photos that have some artistic and saleable value uh, to get other people involved, do use a calibrated tool. I'm not going to recommend it because it depends on your computer. And do put a monitor in a room with controlled light. My wife didn't like it when I put blackout shades in my office in order to keep the straight light out, but that's how I keep all the extra light from hitting my monitor and confusing the colors and so forth. And the rest is just stuff. You can go to the website and get the rest of these tips. Okay, so now I'm going to get to some processing, and I thought about it. I'm just going to show you this one example because I got a bunch of things wrapped into it. 
And I will apologize in advance if I fumble because I forgot the dongle for my mouse, so I have to use the trackpad, and I'm not very good at it. Okay? But I started with this question with this puzzle. What do you get when you combine 112 of those with one of those? Now, the resources and so forth, just get the notes. I already talked about them. Get the notes, and you'll have that. That's the website, by the way. Oh, I thought I had already opened it. Bad me. Open recent. Okay, so stated another way, what do you get when you get 112 of those, one of those, which is taken at twilight, not really daylight? What do you get? Well, first of all, just so you know, those are the exposures. How come it's not showing up up there? Um, what's going on? Oh, did it just go off? I just doubled it. That's why. I'm sorry. I apologize. There we go. It is showing up. Those are the exposure settings, in case you were wondering. And this is the result I got. Okay. Thumbs up if that's cool. Thank you. I know that's cool. You didn't have to tell me. No, I know that's cool. Because your that, Instagram told you? Huh? Because your Instagram told you? Because my Instagram told me. That's a very, very smart <laughs> remark. <laughs> No, I know that it was cool because when I posted this photo on Flickr, which is where I primarily put my photos, it got 80,000 hits in two days. Wow. Um, so it's partly, it's revelatory. People haven't seen it before. Nobody's seen formations like this, really. And almost nobody's seen star motion like that. And by, by the fact that I used a daylight or nearly daylight shot for the foreground really sells it, makes it visible. I believe if you're going to take star trails, you can take just pictures of stars moving dots across the sky or moving lines across the sky, and that's interesting to you, but not generally to other people. You know what effort you put into, they don't. So they're just going to judge it on the basis of the, the quality. So how did I do this? Well, as you might have guessed, I have a series of photos. So let's, uh, let's transition. It's really hard to use this mouse, I apologize. So this is one of the photos. Uh, the one that I showed you is the puzzle was much darker, obviously, because it was taken over a period of time from when it got dark to darker, darker, darker. But this is one of the photos toward the middle of the shot. And you can see the formation here. By the way, cool thing about that, it almost depends what angle you use. The formation can get quite different. Um, this is one of the shots. Now, my question is, given that one of the other shots was this one, how, how can I do two things? Number one, how can I use this shot together with that star trail? And I won't talk about that right now because I don't really have time, but here is the star trail. Okay? That's okay, right? Mm -hmm. You can say, yeah, see, that's okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But the one I showed you first is better, right? Why? Recognizable yeah. foreground. Yeah. Interesting foreground, compelling foreground. The trickiest part about all this is just getting the exposure to blend in a reasonable way. You can be a little bit off. You don't want to be garish, but. So I have this shot, I have the twilight shot. So what I'm going to show you very quickly is a couple different masking techniques. So one technique you can try is if you start with this shot, and I teach this on my website, and I've uh, shown it. You can actually use a tool called Threshold. Does anybody know where to find it? Hopefully you know, because pilots get confused. It's do an adjustment layer. No, I don't want an adjustment layer. I want to actually change. Oh, in fact, good point. So I normally will do this. I will do Command-J or Control-J, duplicate the layer. What I'm trying to do Sorry, I didn't make that clear. What I'm trying to do right now is I just want to get a mask that shows the foreground. Because I'm going to use that mask, apply it to the bright photo, and bring in the star circle underneath. Okay? So I want a mask that will just get the dark areas, basically. So one way to do it 
you can you can do all sorts of things. And again, I'm confused right now because I'm having trouble with this mouse. You can do adjustment threshold. Does anybody ever use this? No. Do you know what it does? Yes. So the answer uh, that one of the audience members gave is it defines it divides your exposure into black and white depending on the point. The point is where this carrot is. And if you look at the histogram, you can see that it's way, way, way to the right of most of the data, which is why very little is showing. But watch what happens when I move the histogram this way. Okay? So now, and this is the cool part, I now have, ignoring the stuff at the top, which I would just paint out, I now have a mask. White reveals, black conceals, White you can see, black you can't, depending on how you think of a mask. But I would use this as a mask inverted, we'll get to that in a minute, to mask off, uh, to, to, ma to mask in the bright shot. So one way to do this would be to take this, and I can go through the trouble of doing it. All I have to do here is say, OK. I would go through some trouble. Uh, you don't want to go too far, by the way. I, I would go through some trouble and make this using the, the right bracket big. And what am I doing wrong here? Oh, yes. Control-Z, Command-Z. I'm going to do D to reset the palette. And X switches between white and black foreground. You see that little thing over there? Okay. So what I would do here is I'm going to paint, I would paint this white out. Oh, sorry. Difficulties of using this track bed. I would paint that out because I want to keep this guy. Now I have a foreground selection. What would I do with this? Well, I could do this. I could go here and create a mask. Come back here. Actually, I want this. Control or Command A, Control C. I'm going to do Alt. Anybody know what that is on a Mac? Option. Uh, and I'm going to, whoops, I didn't select it. I'm going to select the mask. I'm going to do a Control V to paint it. Now I'm going to go show it. Sorry? Do you know about apply image? I do know about apply image. Uh, I sometimes have success with it. <laughs> um, what's going on here? What is going wrong here? Ah, yes. Thank you. So, black conceals, white reveals. So the black is blocking out what I want to see. So, control I, or command I. I reverse the mask. Now you see the star trail, and you see the background. Do you notice something about it? Do you want that one? Yeah, that bright stuff down there is kind of annoying, isn't it? So, you could repeat the threshold mask and try to get that to work, or you can try a different technique. Now, first of all, I started with this image, right? This image. That's what I thresholded. Another thing you could try to do is color range selection, which might work really well on this image, so let's try and see what happens. We can do select color range, which I can't find. Down. Down. Down, left, right. Yeah, there you go. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, it's really hard using this thing without the mouse. You just select what you want, and you can even add more selections to it. So you could just keep clicking, keep clicking. I could even click down here where it's not so um, thing. I probably want to set the fuzziness down, but here's the tricky part about color selection: you really don't have that option. Uh, for unique selections? Just select the black. Yes, that's another way. Thank you. Good point. Sometimes you have to think in reverse and select the black, right? So I could have done that. I'm not going to do that right now, but anyway, I'll end up with a selection here. Okay, and I have a selection. It's not ideal selection. You see, I have problems with stars, uh, stars in because they were brighter, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Not a big deal. You can go paint those stars up. That's a little bit tedious as well. However, some shots are worth the work. So what I've shown you is too far is a threshold selection. 
a color range selection. Someone wisely pointed out if you have a dark image with a contrast, you can invert it, select the dark things, and then invert your mask when you need to. Okay? So you can do this. My, what I'm trying to get across to you is two things, really. One is you can combine daylight or near daylight shots and nice guy images and get a compelling foreground, and it doesn't look that cheesy. Would you agree, Mange? It didn't look that cheesy? Okay. There's yet another way to do it, which is the way I usually do it. So let's uh, throw away this mask. But, okay, let's get this selection. Here's how I usually do it. I use the, yes, the quick selection tool. Now you can use the magic wand tool and in some scenarios that works really well. <coughs> but I would just do this, quick select. You usually, I, uh, whoops, this is hard to do with this situation. I'm just going through the sky. The nice thing about this is if you look, it's hard to see, but the marching ants now have blocked out the part that I decided I didn't want because it was going to come out too light. Now a quick select tool, create a mask with it. Again, it's inverted because I selected the sky. So I do control I or command I, invert. <coughs> That's actually better, right? That blue stuff now, there are some things about this. There's some uh, parts here where there's some contamination, some color contamination. You can do color separation with that. Um, I won't go into the details about that, but you see right here, there's a little bit of blue fringe. And it's not easy to see, but there's probably some fringe. No, actually, there's not. That's, that's amazing. There was on the previous one. Yeah, there was. Yeah, so there's some fringing here, too. See the fringing there? How do you fix that? There's two ways. One way is you can, if you're getting the sky, you can grow the selection, which hopefully will knock that off. What I found for most of my night photography are the following two things. Number one, a very crisp selection is always better than a feathered, uh, um, a feathered selection. The reason is, if you're taking something that's bright and something that's dark and you're trying to put it together, you'll get a band somewhere. It'll be either on the interior or the exterior, whatever you're trying to do. So a very sharp selection is usually what I want. By the way, that's why now down the hills is a great place. I'm trying to do what I just did with trees. It's really hard. And yes, I know there's some tooling and I know it's better, but every time I try it with trees, I'm exasperated unless the trees are really dark or unless I can get an image where they're really dark, really bright. By the way, uh, as I, I have a, like a 14 minute video on video where I show how I use these kind of selections. And what I point out is sometimes you're going to manipulate the image so that it's selectable, not to make it pretty. Right? For example, I took that image and I used threshold. I wasn't looking for a black and white foreground, I was just looking for a mask. So sometimes your goal is to take the image and adjust it in a way that you can make a mask out of it, as opposed to something else. You can make masks other ways too. You can use the old path tool and stuff like that. I hate the path tool. It takes forever. Right? Come on, and now if I had a small correction, sure, of course I'd do it. If I was trying to make text on a circle, path tool, whatever, no problem. But it's really a bad tool for trying to make a boundary between these, these letters, but you can't do that as well. Okay. So I've talked about thresholding. I've talked about the magic wand tool. I have talked about using the color uh, sampling tool. But then I will do other things to this image. Let's see, I think I... Oh. One of the things I should show you is often what I do with my selection, when I'm done with it, I'm doing control zero or command zero to fit the screen. I use that a lot because I zoom around. Um, one of the things that I, I do a lot when I create a foreground selection is I actually delete the background. So once I've got the sky selected, I will just delete it with the delete key, right? Uh, you can also use the eraser tool on the selection and erase it. The reason is because now you have a foreground you can put on anything. And here's one of the sneaky, cheap things that I sometimes do. I'm a little loath to admit it. But sometimes what happens is you've got that bit of light pollution at ground level. It's really annoying, right? 
get a nice crisp dark sky. Get nice stars. But there's this light pollution that's coming up in the foreground. There's nothing to stop you from taking the cut foreground that you cut out, like I have here. I don't know if you can tell. You see, it's showing that it's transparent. And you can uh, do one of these numbers on it. Okay? It's a little dishonest, it's a little cheating, but you have my permission. Just don't say that I told you. Okay. <laughs> I tend to, well, obviously I've created some problems because I created a hole, but that's, that's also fixable. I'll tell you a couple other things that I do because uh, um, we're going to run out of time. A couple other things that I do. Is I actually love the content of our film. If I'm doing a panorama and there's like these two borders over here where there should be stars, the content of our film, you know, the even brush tool, boom, boom, got it, great. I sometimes will do a warp or a transform. I try not to do that because when you warp or pull or puppet warp or any that kind of thing, you often get the elongated stars or kind of weird effects or things that bloom that they shouldn't. But another thing you can do is you can take some part of the shot and put it behind and just blend them together, right? So you can put stars back in that were on the borders because you didn't quite shoot it right. So those are the sneaky tricks that I use fairly often. And if you catch me on one of them, well, you know, that would be great. Uh, I actually try these things that I give them. There's astronomy software that will go look and see if they can identify the stars in your photo, and usually it's right. So I must still be getting it accurate enough that, that, that software doesn't get confused. Uh, let's see, I've got, we're, we're, we're going to be over in 10 minutes, which I think is a good time to stop. I will tell you that the whole creation of that star trail is something we'll be discussing on Wednesday in the webinar. It's not free. You can buy the webinar with the advanced effort plus for a very reduced price, or you can just buy the webinar. Um, I don't have uh, any special thing, but you, we will. To, to, you, you just use your computer. It's good to have a microphone so that you can talk, but that's not necessary. You definitely want sound so that you can hear. And you want a computer, not really a tablet, because you're going to want to follow along. It's actually interactive. It's limited to like 30 students, so I don't just open up the world. But that's where I would talk more about it, because it's a two-hour subject in and of itself. But it is stacking. If you want to know very quickly how you can make this stack, you can do it as follows. Let's say I have 100 images that you shot, which is about what this one is. Take 100 images in Lightroom, and you say, load as layers in Photoshop. Then you go get a cup of coffee. <laughs> then you go out to dinner. <laughs> then you come back, and you say, great, select all layers. Then you get another cup of coffee. That actually happens pretty quick. Then you come back. Then you say, select the top, and change all the blend modes at once to light, and you good start out. Or you will get a, a time stack of clouds. That's it. The problem is you got so many layers, you're bogging your computer down with all that memory that is swimming around. Which is why the way advanced stack request is a little different. It loads an image at a time, creates the result. So you never have more than about 10 layers in memory. So it's a lot faster. And have I timed it? Yes, I have. Does it have drawbacks? Yes, I will tell you the drawback. Let's say that you have 100 layers that are marred up by airplanes, you want to get rid of all the airplanes. You're going to be forced to load all those layers for those images one by one, block out, either clone out, or heal out, or black out. You actually just black out them, and then combine them in light mode. So it doesn't work as well for that uh, when you have such images. And I can show you one where you saw the one that I showed you with the, you told the hikers and the airplanes. I actually did that image without the airplane trails. Ah, drove me nuts. It took me hours and hours and hours to get rid of those airplane trails without accidentally removing star trail, which is all about key. So anyway, stacker doesn't work as well in that scenario. And, and I'll grant you that, but it's a heck of a lot faster otherwise. Um, we got like five minutes left. So I think I should stop here. First of all, I want to thank you very much for being a rap audience. Um, and no, but I heard no snoring, um, which which is a good sign for me. I have five minutes left. <laughs> yeah, <five> minutes. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I want to thank your attention. One of the things I really love about doing this is I love the questions. So I thank you for all the great questions you asked. And I'm not just blowing smoke. 
I'm telling you this because many of the articles I write on the website are based on the questions I get. And some of those questions make me think, how would I do that? How did I? Wait a minute. Is that even possible? Those are the kind of things that drive me to do more creative things and processing. And I, I just hit the surface of the kinds of things that I do. So thank you for your questions. Thank you for your attention. Any last questions you'd like to ask, knowing that yours might be the last and therefore the thing everybody in the room will remember. <laughs> so, when you did the, uh, the shots of the galaxy, the still shot, how did it keep the, the stars from moving? Uh, Excellent question. So, for those who are listening in, the question is the shot of the Andromeda galaxy, how do you keep all the stars together that are in the galaxy without the movement, without the smears that you're getting star trail? And the answer is I cheat. The answer is I use a device called an equatorial mount. It's exactly what you put a telescope on. In fact, I did use a telescope for that shot, but I have some that were shot with just my regular telephoto lens on the same thing. It tracks the sky at the rate of the sky's motion, and therefore, you, if it tracks well, you don't have a problem with smearing stars. It's actually one of the latest, greatest techniques in night photography to get a really dense Milky Way by tracking it for a period of time. But of course, it tracks the sky but the ground doesn't move. So you either get smears in your ground, which you have to compensate by doing the kind of trick I just did. And you put your ground, you pick the ground and you put it over top, or you accept the smearing in the ground. Another question up front. Can you say something about um, the transition of exposure and like in a time lapse from dusk until until starlight? In terms of a time lapse that the, the photographs the way you see it. So the question I'm being asked is, uh, what about time lapses from, say, dusk to dark? Uh, how do you do that? I don't know the answer. The answer is it's, it's almost impossible for a camera to do it. It's almost impossible even for your eye to do it if you were to face those things simultaneously. So what I try to do is kind of split the balance. I will wait until it's gotten to be twilight and then a little darker, and then I will start. But you know what? If I'm shooting photos with intervalometer, I don't care if it starts a little early. Those all turn out to be too bright. I just want these. All right. Question? Yeah, do you have an optimum uh, f-stop? Because I know she uses between 1.4 and f uh, The question is, is, is there an optimum f-stop? Um, and there is not a good answer to that. But I do have an article about what to look for in a night photography lens that does talk about it. So. The optimal f-stop is a combination of three things. For night photography, you want to drink up as much light as you can. So the lighter, the better. But if you make it that wide and you get strong coma or strong um, chromatic aberration, or if it's just too fuzzy to use, OK, you pay for f1.4, but you're not using it. So my answer is, for night images, especially the Milky Way, 1.4 to 2.8 is where I live. When I have some foreground or when I'm trying to do something different, then I'll mess with different f-stops. And sometimes I just mess with them just to mess with them. If you open up your lens wider at a higher ISO, you'll get more stars. I have a story on my website that explains why that's true. So a lot of people think if you expose liners, you get more stars, but that's not true. Anybody know why? Stars are moving. Stars move across your sensor, depending on your configuration and so forth, but on average, in about three seconds, it will move from one pixel to the next. It's already soaked up as much light on that pixel as it can, now it's moved on to the next one. So exposing longer doesn't get you more stars. Higher ISO will get you more stars. Bigger aperture will get you more stars. I have a story on my website called uh, uh, drizzle, drizzle, little star. Or I try to talk about that and explain you know, the mechanics of it. Uh, there's another thing that wasn't asked, but I'll briefly say what, uh, what came to my mind is, what if you don't want trailing in your photos? What if you want crisp star photos? The current thinking is, and I've been doing this and I like it, is to hit a high ISO, like 6400 ISO for 10 seconds. You're going to get trailing of stars, and it's going to depend on your lens and so forth how much that is. But it's minimized. There's a trick to that, however, and that is if you set too high an ISO and too long an exposure, you blow out stars. You lose their color. You may lose other details in the sky. In fact, you don't know, the things in the night sky are just like, like the HDR photo I showed you for the sunset. 
there are things in the night sky that are actually much brighter than other things. And if you try to get exposures that make them all work, you might find difficulty. That's true mostly for astrophotography of the sky only kind, but it's also true if you try to get details of, say, the Milky Way. There's a, for example, there's a lagoon nebula there is very red. Uh, and if you overexpose it, it just becomes, it looks like a stop, like in the middle of your photo. Okay, I think I'm about out of time, but there is time for one last question. And remember, this will be forever remembered. Yes, yes, sir. Do you have an ultra wide lens that you recommend? An ultra wide lens that I recommend? Well, ultra wide is relative. So uh, I will tell you that this 24 millimeter broken on manual focus lens is the best lens I've ever owned. Even though it's, all, it's less than $500, which is what I bought it. I have $2,000 lenses and I have $1,500 lenses. So hopefully Canada's not listening right now. Um, I bought their, uh, what is it, 16 to 35 millimeter F2, $2,000 lens. It has cone really bad in the corners. It has vignetting really bad in the corners. It makes it almost impossible to use unless I zoom in a little bit and stop down to take it. Now, don't get me wrong, I've got some photos that have sold and have been magazines from it. Not a problem, but I love this Rokinon. But you have to be willing to deal with uh, the, the, the uh, effect of a manual lens. Okay. Uh, I think I'm out of time. Um, so again, I really do want to thank you. Uh, I would encourage you maybe to check out my website, um, see if there's something you're interested. You can find my way to contact me, see if that's starcircleacademy.com. I do not guarantee I'll answer you because I'm a busy guy too. But if it's an interesting question, the best way to get my attention is to post it as a comment on one of the existing articles. I read those at least every few days when I usually respond to them. Sometimes it's snarky comments, but usually, <laughs> you, usually it, it's, it's, it's hard work. Uh, thank you so much again uh, for coming, and please try something. <laughs>